Right, so I'm reading chapter nine from our class reader, The Boy at the Back of the Class. Remember, I'm going to share it on the Kindle screen so you can read along with me. See if you can follow the text. The big fight. The next morning, I told Josie, Michael and Tom about the unexpected adventure my mum had taken me on. And they all said they wanted to come with me next time and meet the man in the red turban with the king's heart too. None of them had ever seen inside a pomegranate before, so I tried to describe the colour and the shape of the seeds. I think pomegranates are now my most favourite fruit in the whole wide world. Not just because of the way they taste, but because of how they look. On the outside, they look like extra shiny balls that have been dipped into a bucket of sunset colours like peach and pink and gold. But the inside is even cooler because when you pull one open, it's like finding a million sparkling red rubies all squashed together inside a round suitcase and bursting to get out. You have to push each one out gently, Mum had said when she had cut mine open and showed me how to pop the seeds out. See? as if you're plucking out jewels from the roof of a cave. She showed me how to peel off the skin, lying between the seeds too. But I didn't like that part so much, because the peelings looked like bits of old snake skin that I'd seen in a zoo once. I meant to give the pomegranate to the new boy at home time, but I was so excited that I couldn't wait until then. So as soon as the bell for first break began to ring, I hid the pomegranate under my school jumper and hurried out into the playground with it. We're not allowed to take food into the playground because we're only supposed to eat snacks in the dinner hall. But I wasn't going to eat it or make anyone else eat it, so I didn't think it counted. The new boy followed us out because he knew that we were his friends now. He had stopped disappearing every break time and only went to have his seclusion during lunch times. Even Miss Hempsey had stopped coming out during first breaks and went to the staff room, which I think meant she knew we were the new boy's friends too. Here, I said, as soon as we got into our corner of the playground. And pulling the pomegranate out from under my jumper, I held it out to him. It's for you. Josie and Michael looked at each other and Tom looked at me and we all waited for the new boy to say something. But he just stared and stared, first at us and then at the pomegranate and didn't say or do anything. Knew you should have put a sticker on it, whispered Tom, shaking his head. Then, slowly, the new boy reached out and took the pomegranate in his hands. Home he said quietly, his lion eyes getting very big. I have home. Yes, I said, you're home in Syria. I've seen it on a map. You know, map. The new boy fell quiet. And then, for the first time since we had met him, he smiled. Not a small smile, or a side smile, or even a half smile but a real proper smile that went from one cheek to the other and which made his eyes smile too. He opened his mouth to say something when, suddenly, Brendan the bully pushed past us. Gimme that, he said, and he snatched the pomegranate from Armet's hands. Give that back, I shouted, feeling scared and angry all at once. Make me, sneered Brendan the bully as he turned around to face me. I don't know why, but sometimes when someone you don't like looks at you right in the eyes, they suddenly seem to grow taller and you seem to grow shorter, even when really you're both the same size. Usually it's only for a few seconds and then you grow back to your normal height again. But sometimes it goes on for so long that you wonder if you'll ever get back to the height you used to be. This was one of those times. When Brendan the bully turned to look at me, he stared into my eyes. Sorry.
He stared into my eyes so hard and for so long that he seemed to grow by at least two more inches. But I was feeling so hot and angry, I could feel my ears going red. I could feel my face getting redder and redder and my legs getting shorter and shorter as I tried to jump up and snatch it from him. Then suddenly he threw the pomegranate to Chris who was standing behind me. Chris caught it and tossed it up and down in one hand waiting for us to try and do something. Josie and Tom and Michael all lunged forward but Chris was too quick and threw the pomegranate to Liam who quickly threw it back to Brendan the bully. This might have carried on all break time because Brendan the bully likes playing this game and no one has ever beaten him at it. But then what happened next was so unexpected, so shocking and so fantastic that even Brendan the bully didn't know what to do. Because suddenly, with a huge roar, Armet ran straight at Brendan the bully and like an angry lion, crashed into him with his head. Brendan the bully fell backwards and onto the floor, his legs swinging up into the air. We all gasped out loud, but Ahmet didn't stop there. He jumped on top with his face red and patchy and punched Brendan the bully as many times as he could, showing, shouting something that none of us could understand. Someone behind us cried out, fight, and everyone in the playground ran over to watch. But, and this was the most shocking thing at all, it wasn't really a fight. You need two people at least to be fighting for it to be a fight. And Brendan the bully wasn't fighting back, not at all, not even for a second. Instead, he was holding his arms over his face as Ahmet continued punching and roaring and shouting at him with all his might. Break it up now, shouted a voice as the crowd parted and Mr Irons and Mrs Sanders came running through. But Ahmet wouldn't stop. He was like a machine that didn't have an off button and he continued to punch and punch and punch just as hard and as fast as he could. Right, young man, cried Mr Irons. And grabbing him by the back of his jumper, Mr Irons lifted Ahmet up off Brendan the bully whilst Mrs Sanders pulled Brendan the bully back onto his feet. Everyone fell quiet, but I don't know if that was because we were all wondering what was going to happen next, or because none of us could believe that Brendan the bully had actually been hurt. His face was bright red and his eyes looked watery, and there were tiny stones from the playground floor stuck to the sides of his cheeks. With a horrible glint in his eye, Mr Iron stared down at Armet and shouted, What do you think you're doing, boy? Eh? Eh? Armet stared angrily at the floor and didn't say anything. Who started this? shouted out Mrs Sanders, who was so angry that she had forgotten to look over her glasses and was looking at everyone straight through them instead. I immediately pointed to Brendan the bully and so did Tom and Josie and Michael. Right, all of you, with me, now, ordered Mrs Sanders, dragging Brendan the bully by the arm across the playground and into the school. Mr Irons flicked his hand and pointed to the doors, his nose whistling louder than it had ever whistled before. I followed Tom and Josie and Michael as we all hung our heads and made our way through the crowds. Everyone stared at us and they stared at Armet. His face was even redder than mine and his lion eyes were so big and wet it looked as if they were drowning. He wiped away an angry tear and looked back over his shoulder. I looked back too and saw lots of bright pink spots all over the ground. The pomegranate had smashed open and all its ruby red seeds had been crushed beneath everyone's feet. After we told Mrs Sanders all about what had happened, she gave me 50 lines to do for taking the pomegranate out into the playground and said that Armet and Brendan the bully had to write lines every night for the rest of the week with Mr Irons. We tried to tell her and Mrs Calm that the fight wasn't Armet's fault and that sometimes 
hitting someone when they're being horrible and taking something that's yours away from you can make you feel a hundred times better than just telling a teacher ever would. Even a million times better. But they just shook their heads and said that Ahmet never should have hit Brendan the bully. We didn't say anything after that, because sometimes you can tell when grown-ups won't listen to you anymore. Usually they say, that's an end of it, or I've said my peas, or that's that. But teachers always say, that's all, you can leave now. As we left, I told Ahmet that I was sorry for getting him into trouble and that I would try and find another pomegranate for him. All he did was give me a nod and a thumbs up. I think it was his way of telling me not to worry and that being able to roar like a lion on top of a bully was worth Sorry, I've lost my place. Was worth doing lines for even if it was hundreds of them in a language he didn't know how to speak yet. As we all went home that afternoon, we talked about the big fight and how Ahmet was going to be famous because he was the first boy ever to have beaten up ben Brendan the bully. You wait and see, said Tom. Everyone is going to want to be his friends now, even the cool kids. I guess Tom was right, but it made me feel sad. If Ahmet made friends with the cool kids, that meant he wouldn't talk to us or play football with us anymore. There's a law that says cool kids can only ever hang out with the other cool kids and that they mustn't ever talk to us, except for when they're put in a group with us by a teacher. I don't know who wrote the law, but Michael knows all about it. I guess his mum must have told him. But it turned out Michael was wrong about the law because Ahmet never stopped being our friend, not even after he became the most popular boy in school for beating up Brendan the bully, and not even when all the newspapers in the world made him the most famous refugee boy on the planet. And that's the end of chapter nine.